All right, so if you've watched my previous videos on posing models in DAS and importing them into Blender, you'll be well acquainted with my workflow. If you haven't checked those videos out, I highly recommend doing so before watching this video, if you're planning to follow a similar workflow, of course. So when starting in here illustration, I always tend to focus on the main characters first. All of my covers feature one or more central figures, so I try to make them the focal point. I've worked primarily on book covers for the past few years, and what I've actually found is that readers are really drawn to covers with characters on them. There's a sort of instant personal connection that happens, I think. So I always aim to make my characters interesting, expressive, and well thought out beforehand. For this illustration, I knew that I would be portraying an albino viking woman, and I wanted to emphasize her strength and dedication to reaching this mountain peak in order to get into an ancient hatch. I knew she'd have an athletic body, and this is something that you can actually change in the body type parameters in DAS. I found a few references, both real life and hand drawn, that conveyed that sense of strength and adventure I was looking for. I advise to always use reference when posing models, even if it's just a very simple pose. It often helps to get into that pose yourself and pay attention to like the small details like how your fingers naturally curve, the limits of your limbs, and so on. You might think you know how a pose looks like, and I'm not trying to like tell you you're a bad artist or anything like that, but it's kind of like when you're asked to, for example, draw an animal you've seen like a thousand times before, and after having tried for a while, when you look at some reference, you just realize like how wrong you are. <laughs> Um, this happens to me all the time, it doesn't mean you're a bad artist, it's just always wise to kind of use reference, you know? Anyway, I knew this viking woman was going to have some rope and an anchor attached to the rope tip, so I thought of doing a few versions of her swinging the rope and having the rope hang down, uh, which I think would be interesting and would give my client like a few variations of thumbnails to like choose from, so the poses aren't like all the same. The problem is, and you'll see that with the model with the extended arm, Daz doesn't really capture the twists and turns of the arm and the arm deformations that happen very well. So if you're going to do something like that in your own work, make sure to look at actual reference when you're painting over. Cause I mean, these Daz models can actually be fairly inaccurate even though they look pretty realistic. I think you can see, yeah, when I twist the camera, the arm looks almost broken. Most of the Daz limbs have these sort of limits set upon them to make sure that you don't bend them like completely out of control, but you can turn them off if you want to. Sometimes a pose looks super broken from the side, but when you look at the pose in the camera view, it just works. Omerjan, my partner over at Polycosm, actually made a whole design principles video talking about just that. He talks about how he isn't fond of drawing right on top of 3D models, but just use them as like a rough guide and tweaks the pose even more when drawing from the reference. It's a really good video and teaches a valuable lesson of not relying too much on 3D models when doing an illustration. I know it can be super tempting and you might think everything looks correct and everything's so detailed and polished, especially if you're an inexperienced artist, but honestly developing those core drawing fundamental skills will just improve not only your 3D work, but the paint over later on. And actually, in a lot of cases, you won't have to actually spend a lot of time on the 3D part because you'll have enough knowledge to take that rough base and fill in the blanks in the paint over stage. It's sort of like how people draw full on figures from just cylinders and boxes. Yeah, sorry, I'm gonna stop. I don't wanna come across as like too preachy. <laughs> So here I knew I wanted to add in a knife in her mouth while she clenches down, brows furrowed and everything, and Daz lets you do that super easily. You can open the model's mouths, change facial expressions by individually tweaking the face parameters, and I think this is probably my favorite feature in Daz, honestly. 
who get a wide range of facial expressions, really anything you can think of. I think the only thing you can't really do properly is having their tongue stick out, but eh, I mean, how often do you really need that? So we've reached the part of the process where I'm pretty much done with the models and I am ready to import them into Blender. I just save the file and also the basic data file separately. If you don't know how to do that, follow this video, which I will link to in the folder. The video basically covers the whole installation process, the setup and how to utilize the DAS importer add-on in Blender, which I am using right now on screen. I'm going to speed up the footage again, but basically I just want to sort out the models in different numbered folders to keep track of the different versions since they'll all have different camera views and props. I create a camera, make sure the dimensions are correct under the render properties and using the camera to view function, I roughly aim it at the character. I move the camera into the folder marked one and start working on some ropes. So I just wanted to kind of pause here and kind of show you how to add in ropes and circles and stuff like that. If you're familiar with Bezier curves, I would just recommend you skip over this bit. Um, but let me delete this. The way you get in curves is to hit shift A on your keyboard and you can choose either Bezier or circles. So in the illustration, we're actually going to be using both. So we're going to be using Bezier for the one that hangs loose and circles for the rope that's kind of curled in her hand. So let's just bring in a bezier and you're going to see that it's quite curved. So if you want to straighten that out, all you have to do is go into edit mode, select everything with A and then hit S, Y because this is the Y axis and zero to kind of completely reset that. So what we can do now is if you want to rotate, you can rotate like this or if you press double R, you can rotate it freely. You can move it with G and you can scale it up and down with S. It's actually easier to see if I move it a bit and scale it now so you can kind of see what that does. Um, so let's bring it down again. So let's head out of edit mode, hit R, 90 degrees and X, no, Y, yeah, Y to get it uh, standing up. So this is basically what I did for the rope that was hanging down. So if I add a bit of curvature like this, maybe increase that a bit. And what we can do now is go into the curves menu. And if we go down to geometry, what you can do is you can either extrude it. This is actually what we're going to be doing for uh, the paper bits. So if you do that, you get a completely flat shape that you can actually manipulate. So this is really good for paper. Um, but that's not what we're going to be using. We're going to be using the bevel option down here. So if we increase the depth, you can see that it immediately turns into a rope. And you can increase the resolution if you want, but I'm not too worried about that since we're going to be painting over the rope anyway. But yeah, once we're here, you can actually select two points if you want, and you can right click and subdivide it. And basically what that does is it adds another point and we can rotate this, we can scale it and you can also choose a point and hit E to extrude and just keep going like that. E, rotate, E, E and so on. And so yeah, you can keep subdividing in between here if you want. So if you choose two new points, subdivide. So you can keep doing this or you can choose all of them and hit subdivide and you'll get a lot more flexibility to kind of work on the curves. So yeah, you can see how this is quite useful. If you want to convert this from a curve into a mesh, all you need to do is just right click and hit convert to mesh. And if you now head into edit mode, you can see that it's completely converted into a mesh. So heading back to our draft, this is exactly the method I use for all of the ropes. I wanted to mimic the same feeling of the reference image that you're seeing on screen, which really spoke to me and is initially what led me to the idea of climbing with just her bare hands and ropes and nothing else. That is how hardcore she is. <laughs> so here I added in that circle that I was talking about, the Bezier circle. And note that I am duplicating all of the curves while in edit mode. 
I just find this to be a much cleaner way of working and once I'm happy with the placement I can apply some thickness and all of the ropes will get the same thickness at the same time. Once I felt done with the first version I decided to move on to the next model and for this one I wanted her to kind of hold a knife in between her teeth so I went and searched for a knife on Sketchfab. You can get this handy little add-on completely for free and what it does is actually create a link to every free model on Sketchfab so you get like a large library of models to choose from. You can filter by categories, face count, whether the model is animated and so on. It is really great, I highly recommend it. Sometimes the model comes in parented to a bunch of empties so to kind of sort of clean all of that up I right click select the model's hierarchy, press alt p to unparent the model and keep the transformations and then select the meshes that got separated and hit ctrl j to join all of them. You can now rename the model and move it to its relevant folder and just delete all the previous folders hierarchy with right click to kind of clean up our inspector a bit because it tends to get very bogged down when you add in a lot of models. Next I duplicated the previous rope that we had made and just made the relevant adjustments. I knew I wanted the grapple hook to kind of hang off the tip here so I just adjusted the curves until I got the desired effect. Once the second version was done, it was time to work on the more dynamic model. The one slinging the rope forwards towards the camera. I didn't have a proper camera set up yet, so I just kind of guesstimated the placement of the rope and headed into Sketchfab to find a grapple hook. Now if you're wondering about whether or not it's okay to use Sketchfab models, as long as you aren't reselling the models or you aren't using for example a very uniquely designed character as your main focus in a render or illustration that you'll profit off of, you should be in the clear. When in doubt, always just contact the original creator of the add-on. Their username will be listed in the Sketchfab window, which you can see right about here. So similarly to the grappling hook, I created a super rough primitive base for the entrance to this ancient structure and found a hatch to kind of serve as a placeholder while I work out these initial composition drafts. I thought this addition would kind of give my client a good idea of what I had in mind in terms of placement and storytelling and would also serve as a really good sense of scale. For all three pose versions, I started adding in some cameras and kind of duplicating the hatch around. To keep everything nice and tidy in my folders, I had one hatch per camera view. Now to avoid Blender being bogged down in terms of performance, I created instances of the hatch. So to do that, you just use Alt D instead of Shift D and then just move the hatch models to their respective folders. Also, to give a better idea of perspective and depth, I added in some super rough placeholder rocks. These were also put in place to kind of show that this is quite the drop, which really emphasizes how dangerous this climb is, for one, and again to emphasize how ballsy our Viking woman is. So for each of the camera views, I'm basically moving these rocks around, but arranging them a bit differently to fit the composition better for that particular camera view that I'm working on. I want to avoid having the character overlap with the rocks too much. I mean, some overlap is good though, because when I get to the painting stage and get to push these rocks back in terms of value, you know, because of fog and atmosphere, Having our Viking woman whose values are dark and more contrasted against the compressed and low contrast rocks, this will really help push the idea of depth and that these rocks are quite a distance away. We'll get more into this later on, but I think this is an important thing to kind of keep in mind while creating the thumbnail. I'm going to just let the time lapse play for the duration of the thumbnail creation, but hopefully by this point you've gotten a good idea of my approach in regards to thumbnailing. I'll jump back in at the timestamp on the screen to explain how to render out viewport renders, so if you'd rather just skip the time lapse, now's your chance.
Once I'm happy with each of the camera views, I decide to render out my thumbnails through View, Viewport Render Image. The reason I'm using this and not the actual render engine is because I just want my render in clay shader material without anything else that's distracting such as lights, material colors and so on. When doing this, just make sure that you have the overlays turned off up here or else you'll get the ground grid, the selection outline and everything else included. I then just go through all of my camera views by selecting them and hitting numpad 0 and just basically repeat this process for all of the thumbnails. In total, I ended up with 8 thumbnails. I advise for you guys to give your client a few options to choose from, especially when working with 3D. That's sort of the advantage of 3D, isn't it? My advice to you is if you're working with clients who have little experience with 3D, sometimes they have trouble kind of translating that 3D draft into a final product. They might not be able to visualize that workflow, so I recommend giving them a range of options and show previous examples where you've used this particular workflow. That always seems to help convince any hesitant client of mine. And this might not apply to you, of course, but I found that once you've sort of gotten to know your client and their style a bit, you can kind of reduce the number of thumbnails as you'll sort of understand what they're after. I instead invest that time in making the illustration as polished as I can. Enough chatter, time to arrange the thumbnails in a presentable manner. You might be confused as to why there are seven thumbnails. I actually ended up going back and added in an eighth version. With thumbnails, I always aim to present them next to each other in a tidy manner. This helps your client or team decide as they can quickly compare the versions and make up their mind which version they prefer. This helps your client or team decide as they can quickly compare the versions and make up their mind which version they prefer. Some thumbnails are quite alike, so if presented individually, it might be difficult for them to make up their mind. And for presentation's sake, I just outlined all of the images, made them bluish in hue, and then numbered them all. Also, this is a personal preference, but I tend to add a noise layer on top that's set to soft light, and I just sharpen all of the images to make them pop a bit more. I won't go over the last version in Blender, as it's literally just repeating the steps earlier on, but here are all of the eight versions. Hopefully they read fairly well. At this stage, I just send this over to my client and ask his or her opinion. This marks the end of this thumbnailing process and in the next video, I get into choosing a thumbnail and turning that thumbnail into a more realistic scene in Blender. See you in a bit.